Welcome back to Reality Call Show. Today I'm talking with Greg Johnson, who is the editor of Countercurrents, which I believe is a publishing company. Is that right, Greg? That's right. And thank you for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining me. And so um, we're actually going to talk about white nationalism because you identify as a white nationalist. Um, and I just thought it'd be interesting for us to talk about what that is and uh and why you identify that way unfortunately we, we are having a little bit of trouble with um the skype connection so if the audience hears us talking over each other that's just skype it's not something we have much control over um but would you mind starting by telling us what uh what your view of what na white nationalism is certainly white nationalism is just the idea that the best political order is a patchwork of sovereign nation states for ethnically distinct peoples. And that, that larger principle is what we call ethno-nationalism, and of course it applies to any race. Being white myself and being concerned about demographic trends and political trends which are threatening the future of white people worldwide, I'm most concerned about whites. And I think that white nationalism, meaning ethnostates for different white peoples, is really the best solution to staving off long-term demographic uh, problems that whites are facing. And so there's a, there's a widespread misconception that what white nationalism means is just the idea that if you're white, you belong in the same state. And I think that that's a somewhat ridiculous idea. I think it's a, a, a parody, actually, of what most white nationalists believe. Most white nationalists believe that the natural political unit, the most functional political unit, the one that's most consistent with maintaining peace among different peoples and also conditions where different peoples can develop and live according to their own view of what's right, is the, the nation state. And that means that we are all for preserving differences and borders between white peoples, right? The, mo the great conflicts of the 20th century were largely between different white nations. And largely those conflicts came about because these groups were not respecting the autonomy of other white groups. And so we think that, first and foremost, the, the, we would like to have peace between our own peoples, right? And then after that, we need to also deal with the threats uh, posed by large geopolitical and racial blocks of rivals uh, to, to European peoples. The, the two biggest ones are in Europe, of course, it's, it's the Islamic world. That's the great threat right now. Europe is being invaded by Muslims. And these Muslims are there with a very conscious design of spreading their religion and political order to Europe. Uh, they're quite open and frank about that. And it really does constitute a somewhat slow and stealthy invasion. But many invasions in the past have been slow and stealthy invasions uh, by you know, demographic replacement. They're not necessarily armies blitzing over borders. When you look at the end of the Roman Empire, the end of the Roman Empire came about because they thought it was really a clever idea to bring in these Germanic tribes and settle them in Roman lands and try and enlist them in their legions and they'll do jobs that Romans won't do, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> and by the time Rome was sacked, it wasn't sacked by people who came from outside the empire, but primarily by barbarians who were living within its borders mm -hmm. and had finally had enough of being ruled by a very effete and corrupt uh, elite that uh, they they held in contempt. So that that process of invasion and demographic replacement the, that's going on today is not something unusual in history. In the United States and Canada, the main problem is 
invasion from the global south, uh, especially Latin America. The Canadians are also happily importing people from everywhere. Uh, but uh, I guess it's primarily a, a U.S. problem, uh, the invasion of Latin Americans, largely non-white mestizos or Indians. So what we need is white distinction and diversity where we have our own little homelands. And we need a certain amount of coordination and unity and solidarity when facing geopolitical threats from non-white groups. Uh, there, there's also, of course, the, the, the Chinese question and South Asia, Africa, and so forth. These are distinct groups of people, uh, distinct geopolitical blocks, and it would be nice if we could have white nations coordinating their plans uh, with them in order to survive rather than <laughs> what we have today, which is our leadership is basically conspiring to replace our populations with non-whites from around the world. Mm -hmm. So so one objection I suppose people might have to uh, this idea that, oh, we're being replaced is, well, we're all the same anyway, so what does it matter? What's your perspective on that? Well, wait a second. I thought diversity was a wonderful thing. Uh, yeah. uh, the same people who say we're all the same and it doesn't matter are also the ones who say, oh, is, isn't it wonderful that we can get shawarma in London now? Uh, isn't it wonderful that uh, we have pygmy restaurants? I, I don't know if you actually have pygmy restaurants yet, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we had abos and pygmies and other groups like that opening up little restaurants in West London somewhere? Wouldn't that be chic and interesting? Uh, the the left, and it's not really just the left, it's the globalist establishment that's promoting multiculturalism and non-white immigration. They really speak with forked tongues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For instance, yeah, so non-white immigrants are simultaneously people who are, have low skills and do the job. And people with great skills will do the important professional jobs that white people just won't do. Uh, and they're, they're peaceful and law-abiding people, uh, far less uh, criminal than, than native Europeans. And on and on. They, 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 they say all kinds of different things. They say that diversity is a wonderful thing and it only makes us stronger. And we're all, all, all the same and it doesn't matter anyway. And at a certain point, you just have to conclude that these people are not honest and if they're not honest, you've got to stop listening. And eventually, you've got to simply defeat them politically to prevent them from doing what they're doing. And that's one of the hardest things for white people to, to wrap their minds around. The possibility that there are people in positions of power who are simply self-interested Machiavellian liars. I mean, on, on the one hand, everybody is willing to entertain that notion, right? There's a lot of shallow, facile cynicism about politics. But oddly enough, people still seem to have a great difficulty wrapping their minds around what you would do if you really believe that our leaders are lying to us, and that they have very evil ulterior motives that they're pushing. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the when you look at the contradictions, though, of this, this globalist rhetoric, uh, the uh, the left is for globalism because of socialism, and the right is for globalism because of capitalism. But they all promote the same ultimate end, which is a sort of giant plantation economy ruled over by a fabulously wealthy and corrupt elite. You have to, you have to start wondering about sincerity of a lot of these voices that are putting forward uh, the same conclusion with a whole whole raft of different arguments that are directed at different constituencies, right? They're, they're tr the, the common denominator, though, is that they're trying to swindle the native European peoples of all the European lands, and also European colonial peoples like Americans and Canadians and others, of having a future, of having homelands where they can be confident that they will control the government, control their destiny, 
and have a country that they feel is like home as opposed to something that's increasingly like a Middle Eastern bazaar uh, when you when you go to parts of London or increasingly like Latin America in large parts of the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've I've got a few questions here that I've asked um, my audience to ask you. When I asked asked them to submit questions, some of them, you know, were quite rude and uh, automatically, um, you know, wanted to to make a point about how much they objected to even asking you questions. <laughs> but most of them were quite willing to ask questions. So I'm going to give a few a shot. And I've actually got quite a lot of them. So um, if you could give a fairly brief response. Um, what life experiences formed your worldview? Um, what was your home life like growing up and through school? Well, I grew up in a very homogeneously white community. And it was only really when I went off to college that I was exposed to different groups of people. And my initial assumption was that we're all basically pretty much the same. And we can all sort of live together in, in the same way that I lived when I was growing up in a small homogeneously white town. And I discovered very quickly that that's not the attitude of many minorities in the United States. Uh, many of them have a great deal of distrust and hostility to whites and basically look at us as people that they would like to victimize. Uh, and if not victimize, at least there's a lot of sort of subtle mockery and, uh, how to put it, uh, passive aggression in, in day to day interactions. And so eventually I started realizing that this, this is not actually working. And I realized that basically my multicultural phase, if you will, was rooted in projecting my own mentality on the rest of the world. Yeah. There's, there's a, there's a deep form of hubris and ethnocentrism that is present in multiculturalism. The old form, sort of Mark I multiculturalism, is basically the white man's burden idea. It's the imperialist idea that all of these people really want to be like us, and we're going to go out and we're going to give them all the benefits of our civilization because all the good things come from white people, and we're going to share those gifts with them, and that's the white man's burden. The flip side of that is the guilty leftist anti-colonialist uh, white mentality which is just as grandiose because instead of assuming that all good things come from whites and basically non-whites don't have any agency of their own and, and have no worldview and no way of life that they are right to want to hold on to, this, this leftist mentality basically blames us for all the bad things that happen in, in the world to white people. Hmm. Uh, it's our fault. And the underlying uh, identity there, though, is the same grandiose notion that really we're the only people who matter for good or evil in the world, and that these other people are somewhat negligible as agents. And that, that assumption is very deep in uh, a sort of bedrock assumption in a lot of leftists. And I really stopped the projection, I guess. I stopped the projection and decided I need to try and understand the world as these people see it. And I came at a certain point to realize that a lot of people's, in fact, the majority of people's on earth do not have a sort of transparent and trusting relationship to other groups. In fact, they have uh, suspicious, hostile, and manipulative relationships to other groups. And that What's going on in white countries is we're inviting in people on the assumption that they're going to be just like us, that we're going to be generous to them and open to them, and they're going to be open and generous to us. And in fact, their attitude is, is that we're incredibly weak and naive, and they will, they will dissimulate belief in our ideas, right, when they want something from us. Mm -hmm. But when we want something from them, uh, they'll they'll say, oh, yes, yes. But what they'll end up doing is practice very ruthless ethnic nepotism. Mm -hmm. And they've hacked us in a way. They've, they've hacked our minds and they're using our 
openness and goodness to exploit us. And that puts us in a very disadvantageous position in a sort of game theoretical way. Because if you're playing poker, right, and you have the biggest stack of chips, but everybody else at the table has a wild card, namely the race card that they can play. Whereas you don't think of yourself as a member of a race. You think of yourself as an avatar of universal humanity, right? And so they're, if you play that game, they're going to pull out the race card and use that wild card in hand after hand after hand. And they're going to have a systematic advantage in every hand that you play. And you might have a very big stack of chips at the beginning, but you will lose everything if you keep playing by those stacked rules. And that's basically the way that multiculturalism works. They have the race card. They can always play it, but we can't. And really what white identity politics is in its starting phase, which is today, is just getting whites to recognize that the game as it's constituted today in multicultural societies is rigged against them systematically. We will lose if we play this game, if we don't take our own side, if we don't start playing the race card and thinking about our own collective interests as a group. And once we start down that path, though, eventually, my hope is we're going to see that it was quite wise and quite wonderful that there was a time when Britain was virtually 100 percent white. Uh, and it was quite wise and quite wonderful when France was virtually 100 percent white. Well, you didn't have these alien groups moving around and basically swindling you out of your future. And it's not just marginal groups like, you know, the stereotypical gypsies of the past, right, um, who are, are doing this, who are, who are tiny groups. Uh, but it, it's now... The upcoming majority, the rising majority in France and yeah. England, the there are countries in Europe where there are more babies named Mohammed than any other other name. Yeah, right? that's the case in Ireland right now. Yeah. And that yeah. and that means that in the long run, uh, you're going to be outbred in your own homelands in Europe and certainly in the United States and Canada as well by people who basically are hostile and are there to take away what we have created. They're to take away our wealth, take away our civilization, take away our future. And when I started realizing that that was the, that was the game and that the long-term consequences were quite dire, that's when I decided I can't be liberal anymore. That's when I decided I can't be an individualist anymore. Liberal individualism blinds us to the pr priority of ethnic politics okay. and but that is going to uh, if, if we don't break out of that mindset we're going to lose everything that we've got yeah. sorry that wasn't too brief but no, okay. i'll try and be brief actually my follow-up question is why why do you think that you got this perspective because so many people have experienced very similar you know things to you yet they haven't come around to your perspective so why do you think that might be well, I think that our civilization today is ruled by people who are promoting multiculturalism. They're promoting it through entertainment, through education, through the basically through the news media, through every channel, every authoritative channel that molds opinions in our society today, whether news or entertainment media, education and so forth is pushing this multicultural agenda. They're pushing this idea that white people are guilty for all the world's ills and that if we're having difficulties with uh, immigrant groups and so forth, that's somehow our fault, that we better keep quiet about it, that the worst possible sin is to be racist or ethnocentric. And a lot of people are simply intimidated by this. They're intimidated into silence over this. And the thing that helps them maintain their silence, though, is the naive assumption that somehow if they make their separate peace with this system, that things will sort of work out all right for them. Mm -hmm. right? they, the, 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 our individualism, our kind of devil take the hindmost attitude and our unwillingness to confront the fact that this game is rigged against us and that the long term trends are quite dire and that we simply will cease to exist as 
distinct nations and as a biological race in a couple hundred years if we don't stop this then then i think that yeah because okay so we're individualistic we're guilty we try and make our own peace with the system Uh, we we're afraid of joining together and actually trying to change it Uh, and i think a lot of us are just evading or ignorant uh, of the uh, long-term consequences of staying on this path and so I think all of those things combine together to prevent people who are on some level aware that there's a problem from actually drawing the right conclusions that we've got to do something about it. I do think all people are hardwired for a certain level of ethnocentrism. And that's scientifically been proven. It's been studied. And it turns out that whites are the least ethnocentric race. And that means that we are the most trusting and welcoming of outsiders. Mm -hmm. However, at a certain point, we're going to stop feeling trusting and welcoming of outsiders uh, because our ethnocentrism ethnocentrism will kick in. We're also, as a race, the one that's I'm a little bit skeptical of that. You know, having grown up in London, um, whites are now, you know, less than 50% of the population in London. Um... But I, I don't see that happening. <laughs> uh, but there are, would you agree that there are more people becoming ethnocentric today than there were no, actually, 10 years ago? People in London, whites in London, um, were like pro-Remain in the EU, which, which puts us at risk of flooding the country with migrants because most of them want to come. They, they get residents in an, e, in an EU country and then once they've got that... Um, visa Mm -hmm. then they can move to the uk and that's what they want to do obviously because it's an english-speaking country most of them speak english already to some extent you know if they speak a language it's going to be english it's not going to be norwegian so (laughs) that's why they prefer to come to the uk and we're at risk of being flooded yeah well how about this what about the whites who have been living uh, leaving london over the past 30 years right why are they leaving well they're probably going to give you uh euphemisms and stories like oh we wanted a quieter neighborhood or oh we wanted better schools for our children or whatever which is the same kind of thing that you hear from whites who are fleeing diversity in the united states but what's going on is they're fleeing diversity and that's how a lot of whites deal with this problem they they try and run away from it how many britons live in spain now lots yeah hundreds of thousands i think that's that's an astonishing thing. Uh, I'd love to do a poll of those Britons who live in Spain, why they moved to Spain. The isn't weather? it odd? <laughs> yeah, the weather. That's what they would say. But uh, isn't it odd that they seem to feel more at home among Spaniards than they do among people in their own country? But then you look at the people in their own country, the people who moved into their neighborhoods. Uh, they, they might not have been British. So there's a lot of white flight that goes on. And I, again, this is a, one way that people avoid dealing with the problem. They, they just run away from it. So you've got a situation now where Germans are moving to Hungary. Germany is, is uh, importing Muslims, uh, migrants, uh, right, uh, refugees. And Germans are fleeing to Hungary, which isn't importing migrants isn't importing refugees but that's really not good for germany as a people and as a nation and it's really not honestly good for hungary either i mean the hungarians are welcoming them because they're bringing money but they should look at them as rats uh, fleeing a sinking ship of rats (laughs) fleeing a plague ship right because a lot of these ideas that messed up Germany are probably uh, lodged in the heads of these Germans who are coming to Hungary and pretty soon they'll start thinking we really need a little more diversity around here. Uh, That's certainly true in the Pacific Northwest in the United States where people fleeing from California to Washington and Oregon and Idaho and Montana are bringing the very attitudes that made their state unlivable. And people do look at them as as rats from the plague ship, you know, uh, fleeing and bringing bringing the plague with them. And it's it's not unreasonable. So, yeah, uh, just to recap, I think a lot of people evade the long term problem. 
a lot of people are unaware that there's a really long-term problem. Uh, they're too individualistic to want to band together and, and take responsibility for the overall problems that their societies are facing. They think that if they just go along and pay lip service to the multicultural regime and maybe move to a better neighborhood, that they can s squeak through life with minimal problems. And they're just not going to think about or worry about the white people that they're hearing about all the time who are having acid thrown in their faces or being beaten and murdered uh, and so forth by these invaders. So that's sort of the general problem. We really are a people with very high individualism, low ethnocentrism, and low solidarity. We're a very weak people when faced with invaders who are highly ethnocentric, highly tribal, and have a dual loyalty and a dual ethical code where they will treat their own people in one way and they will treat us in another way. And basically the way they treat us is they are here to exploit us. And the best way of exploiting us is to exploit our our white guilt uh, and exploit our desire to be open, our feeling that it's high minded to be open and non threatened by and non suspicious of strangers. They're very good at exploiting those uh, those attitudes to their advantage. The trouble is there are so many of them and their reproduction rates are sometimes twice as high as white Europeans, that eventually they're going to take over the country, uh, whatever country they're entering into. And there will be no England anymore. There will still be a Pakistan, but there won't be an England for the English. And that's not a future that I think anybody should want to have. And so just, just in terms of fairness, white people love to be fair. What's fair about a world in which the only peoples that don't have homelands are the peoples of Europe. There's no Norway for the Norwegians anymore. There's no England for the English. There's no France for the French. Uh, what you have instead is these sprawling multicultural uh, societies, primarily Islamic societies, uh, that, uh, none of, uh, n that none of the former natives of those lands feel at home in. What's fair about that? There's always going to be a Muslim world full of Muslims. There's no shortage of them. There's no shortage of Chinese. There's no shortage of Indians. There's no shortage of Africans. In fact, there's a great abundance of them. Uh, there, there will always be an Africa for the Africans. Why is it wrong for us to be concerned about keeping a Europe for the Europeans or America for Americans or Canada, uh, Canada for Canadians and so forth. What's wrong with that? What's unfair about that? Mm -hmm. And well, the other thing that a lot of people are very worried about, and I'm concerned about this as well, um, is when they hear people who are ethno-nationalists or white nationalists saying, you know, we need our own space. Um, they think, well, how are you going to achieve that? Is it going to involve death camps or genocide? So uh, how, how would you, for example, go about achieving such a thing in America or in Europe um, without doing a lot of harm? Well, first of all, Everybody believes that you are justified in basically doing just about anything to avoid becoming a victim of genocide. That, that, that attitude has been drummed into us by six million Holocaust movies and so forth, that practically anything is justified if you're a victim of genocide. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that whites are facing a kind of genocide. Genocide doesn't have to be fast and hot and involve death camps and, you know, trenches full of corpses and things like that. It doesn't have to be that dramatic and photogenic. Uh, the United Nations, a after it was formed and uh, was uh, drafting in the aftermath of the Second World War, its, its conventions on genocide d said that genocide can also include simply the slow demographic erasure of distinct peoples. Uh, how, how does that happen? Well, it can happen by 
invading their homelands and colonizing them and making it impossible for them to reproduce themselves. And that's really what's going on in practically every white nation today, with the exception of a few like Hungary and Poland and so forth that are trying to maintain their borders and, and maintain their ethnic integrity. Virtually every white nation is facing a situation where their long-term prospects are bleak. And even in Hungary and Poland, their long-term prospects are bleak because their reproduction rates are below replacement. Mm -hmm. Right? And when you have a situation where more white people are dying than being born every year, eventually there will be no white people. And the reason why we have this situation is it's not some strange mysterious thing that's inevitable. It's not some cosmic catastrophe. It's not a comet hitting the planet, right? Uh, it, it, it's the product of a culture and of a set of policies, political policies, that were enacted in the aftermath of the Second World War. And if whites are slowly facing extinction because of decisions that were made in the aftermath of the Second World War, then we can change those decisions. We can change those policies. We can alter our culture. We can change our value system so that that problem no longer exists. I think that the first thing that has to be done is we simply have to say no more immigration. Close the borders. It's over, right? Mm -hmm. Then the second thing is to start encouraging people to emigrate. These people weren't brought here, first of all, even though whites are facing genocide, really, as it's technically defined in England or France or the United States, there are no death camps. Things look pretty good. Consumer electronics have never been cheaper, right? Uh, you've got more processing power in your smartphone than they did in these giant computers that sent man to the moon in the 1960s. How, how are we facing genocide? It just doesn't seem to be happening. So you can have a very, very pleasant, orderly, overall pleasant and overall orderly society, a society that has the illusion of being healthy and vibrant, vibrant in a good way, not in the euphemistic uh, multicultural way, but a healthy, vital society where your long-term prospects are nil. So my, my attitude is we should simply reverse these trends that are, that are sending us in the wrong direction, that are sending us towards extinction. And we can do it as slowly and as stealthily as the genocide that's being enacted against us was enacted as slowly and stealthily. We don't need some race war, some paroxysm of ethnic cleansing and things like that. We simply need to change the trends. So 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago now, the United States opened its borders to non-white immigration. And we went from a 90% white country to a 60-some percent white country since then. Mm -hmm. I don't see any reason why we couldn't say, okay, let's go back to status quo 1965. Let's change our immigration policies. How would we do that? Well, first of all, no more immigration from the non-white world. Second, we start inc inc uh, inc encouraging emigration by non-whites. If it was possible for them to move here, it's possible for them to go back. If they came yeah. by planes and trains and automobiles, those yeah. things run both ways. It's possible for them to go back. It's not impossible. It's not inconceivable. It, it's, it's simply a matter of will. It's simply a matter of us instituting policies and trends that cause a net outflow of these people rather than a net influx. And that's totally doable. People know how to do that. The, so say we stop all immigration, step one. Step two, you look at everybody who's come here illegally, and that's a large number of them. You go over all of their paperwork with a magnifying glass. You find everyone that's made a fraudulent claim, that uh, has made, uh, made fraudulent applications for welfare, that, that has put in a fraudulent uh, claim that they were being persecuted in, in their homeland or whatever. You find these people and you deport them. They okay. broke the law. 
They've got no position here. Okay, so you're and really then, just talking about changing general trends and over time yeah. reestablishing the a ethnic majority. integrity of a yeah. country. Yeah, if it, if it took 50 years for us to get into this mess, we mm -hmm. can afford 50 years to get okay. us out of this mess. But here's the thing. If we embarked upon a 50-year project of, say, returning America to the ethnic status quo of 1965, which was a great time in America in terms of productivity, in terms of national glory. We, it's when we had our space program going, uh, fashion looked great. It was a great time. It was a great time in our history. Uh, working class incomes were probably as high as they've ever been. They started declining in the early 70s. That was a great status quo year, and we were 90% white. If it took us 50 years to get back to that, that would be great. But, you know, if we embarked on that program today, we'd start reaping the psychological benefits of it today because I think a great deal of the pathology of white people, the, the nihilism of white people, the drug and alcohol abuse, the suicides, the rising, alarming mortality of middle-aged working and lower middle class white people in the United States is connected to the feeling that they've got no future, not just as individuals, but as a group. Right. And that they're when, not allowed when, to identify as part of a group, which exactly. psychologically is actually very healthy to recognize your um, ethnic group, yeah. your ancestors. It's actually, yeah. I, I read recently that studying your genealogy and finding out about your ancestors improves your mental health and well-being. So <laughs> you can only imagine what it's doing to us being told that we're not even allowed to, you know, feel any sense of pride or accomplishment or, you know, for what our ancestors have achieved or whatever, you know. So, but they will tell us. They will tell us that we should feel guilt for right. all the things that our ancestors did, right? And I, I love that. It's like, well, wait a second. If it makes sense for us to feel collective guilt for things that other white people have done, who are not ourselves, right? Then why is it wrong for us to feel collective pride for the things that other white people have done? And when you look at the balance sheet, the things that we've got to be proud of far outweigh the things that we've got to be ashamed of. And I, I really think it's it's not guilt so much as shame that's the issue. I don't feel any personal guilt for things that I don't do, right? I'm not responsible for the things that I know too. But I can feel ashamed of the things that were done by my family or by my extensive extended family, the, my racial family or my nation in the past. I can feel ashamed of that, but I can also feel pride for the things that they've done. And if white people started feeling proud, uh, pride for all the accomplishments of our people, we'd become much less tractable and guilty and willing to be swindled out of our future. So yeah, I, I think you're right. A sense of who we are, a sense of rootedness, uh, looking, at the, looking in the past, looking at previous generations and seeing your, fe your features in their faces. All of that's a very interesting experience. I remember I was in Munich a few years ago, and I went to the Wittelsbach Palace, uh, the residence palace in, Mu in Munich. And the best thing I saw there was the, the gallery of the ancestors. The Wittelsbachs created a gallery with portraits of all of their ancestors. And some of these, of course, were fanciful portraits because they didn't actually know what some of these people look like because it went all the way back, you know, to the, the, you know, the kings in the early middle ages, right? Uh, you know, Charlemagne was one of their ancestors and so forth. And it was fascinating to walk through this gallery and see all these faces and to see the, when they were actually portraits, you could see that, yes, these were the same people generation after generation after generation. Of course, and these European royals would sort of marry their second and third cousins. And so, you know, the same features would come back again and again and again. It was really it was really a kind of moving experience and a kind of sublime experience. And I, I think it would especially be that way for the the actual Wittelsbachs who were viewing this. It's a reminder of who they were. And I think that the more uh, sense of rooted identity we have, the happier we're going to be, the prouder we're going to be and the, and the less easily swindled out of a future we're going to be. But yeah, there's going to be enormous psychological benefits of simply feeling that we have a future as groups. 
uh, as a group mm -hmm. again. And Can if I you also look at the ask you, sorry, I have to sure. interrupt yeah. you to ask you this. Yeah. But um, so a lot of people obviously are, when they ask about this kind of thing, are also worried about what about the African Americans, which make about 13% of the American population. You know, these people have lived there for multiple generations, speak English. Most of them haven't even been to Africa. You couldn't possibly expect them to repatriate to Africa at this stage. I mean, what would what would you say about that? Well, first of all, let me let me point out that that problem is not a problem that you have to deal with in Great Britain or in France mm -hmm. or in Norway. Well, there are Those, people from multiple generations here, yeah. Yeah, but the, the, here's the thing. Uh, the, there, there are two things here. One, they have even more multiple generations in previous homelands. Uh, the fact is, is that if their roots in those previous homelands didn't matter that much to them, why should their roots, which are quite shallow in your homeland, matter all that much to you? Also, we have a situation where people are constantly forced to move because of things like jobs closing, uh, plants closing, or real estate uh, becoming too expensive. And so your neighborhood becomes unaffordable, your rents go up. Or, you know, you have to move to search for a job because the factory you worked in closed down and has reopened in Indonesia or something. Nobody sheds a tear about the people who are displaced because of really just private greed, mm -hmm. the, the private interests in, in the economic realm. So why should we be so broken up about the idea of people having to move for something that's really important, namely the common good of a people? I think that that is that is the kind of thing we need to um, in, entertain. Now, as 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 for blacks in America, yes, I I think that the 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 just and equitable sort of solution for them would be to simply create a separate homeland for them and encourage them to move there, uh, encourage them to move to several southern states and set up their their autonomous homeland there. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a very reasonable thing. And you just give them incentives. It's like, okay, very significant numbers of blacks receive public assistance in the United States. Say, okay, you can collect your public assistance check in New Africa. Right. And and I think that they would uh, they'd up stakes and move there. And over time, you'd get a situation where again simply through gentle demographic pressures and incentives uh the the trend whereby blacks emigrated from the south into the rest of the country after during and really starting during and after the first world war would be reversed and what were the reasons for that uh for for that em what was the reason for that great migration as they call it well there were jobs opened up uh, whites were off fighting in Europe during the war. Okay, so and you so there were yeah, uh, yeah. non-violent means using f mainly like financial incentives, um, yeah, and and legal means such as deporting illegals and things like that to restore the original ethnic makeup of the United States and also European countries. Yeah, and I think that sounds very reasonable personally. Um, of course, I suppose the the main problem is that we've been so brainwashed to think that this is a hateful thing to do. I mean, what what would you your um, what would your perspective be on on what how to counter this narrative that it's a hateful thing? It's done as out of hate, <laughs> you know. Well, first of all. Hate is a natural, normal emotion that's sometimes defensible. Uh, it, it, it's simply true. And everybody hates somebody. Everybody hates somebody. And the only real question is, is it reasonable to feel hate uh, in certain circumstances? And yes, you want to live in a society where there is a minimum of hatred and violence and tension between people of different ethnic groups. So how do you create that kind of society? Well, as it turns out, ethnic hatred and tension is maximized by multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to, if, we, if we're really opposed to hatred and tension and ethnic violence, 
the best route is to reduce multiculturalism, reduce it to an absolute zero if we can. But that's really the best route. So I think it's perfectly natural, normal, and normal and right to feel hatred in certain circumstances. And it's inevitable that there will be a lot of hatred, and not just hatred, but violence in multicultural societies. And so we need to decrease diversity, and that will decrease hatred. Now, you also have to ask about the people who are imposing these policies on us. I am afraid that quite a lot of liberals and leftists really do hate their own people. And aren't we being taught to hate ourselves? All this white guilt and multicultural propaganda. So there's a whole lot of hate to go around here. And it's not mm -hmm. all on us, right? Mm -hmm. The left hate us. Uh, the left hate their own societies. Uh, you can find plenty of statements where they will say, I, I despise the English, you know, or I, uh, or what an evil society, what an evil, corrupt society uh, we are. We are an evil, awful people. We should hate ourselves. We're, yeah, we have entire generations being taught to hate yeah, ourselves. Yeah, I mean, well, definitely. I mean, I've heard it so many times, like, oh, this town is too white or, you know, this school is too white, what I heard while I was growing up. Um, but actually, I'd also like to ask you a similar kind of question as the last one. What about mixed race people? Um, and I know that sometimes um, people will say, well, what percentage white is acceptable? Is it the one drop rule or what's going here? And what about, you know, what about literally uh, potentially dividing families, for example, with one um, black parent, one white parent, for example? Uh, I know it's I know it's nitpicking, but what is your personal uh, kind of perspective or proposed policy regarding this? Well, first of all, I'm a pragmatist about this. My attitude about race mixing is that we should have a complete amnesty on past race mixing, especially if it was in the distant past, but a complete moratorium on doing it in the future. We're thinking ahead. We're thinking about the future. So I, I would like there to be no more of it. And then the question about what to do with people who are of mixed ancestry is, is really very simple. I think that they should be encouraged to live with the people that they're most comfortable with. And, you know, and, and if people have married into, say, a black family, if there's a, a white who's married into a black family and has for all intents and purposes, black children. Uh, I, th I think that they should be encouraged to to go with their the family that they've married into. Now, there, there are also differences between non-whites. Some of them are more different from us than others. Okay, blacks are very different from whites. Uh, people who are from the Near East and so forth, they're not even, I wouldn't call them white or European, but they're certainly Caucasian. And I and honestly, uh, I, I just don't think that those people are a problem if there's a small admixture. In fact, there's been a small admixture of Near Eastern genes in many demonstrably and, and canonically white nations for a very long time. That doesn't really bother me. With Asians, with Amerindians, with blacks, uh, you know, they're all different. Uh Asians and Amerindians are less genetically distant from whites than blacks are. And so a smaller admixture, a small admixture of those populations doesn't really matter. And it wouldn't really matter at all if we were a growing population, right? Mm -hmm. But the trouble is that we're a shrinking population. And when you have a shrinking core population and you permit outmarriage, that's just hastening the day that we dis that we disappear as a distinct people. So I, I would support laws against miscegenation being instituted in the future. But the best anti-miscegenation laws are simply having a homeland. It's sort of a passive anti-miscegenation law, right? It's like speed bumps, right? They're just sort of there, and so you've got to slow down. Uh, <laughs> borders are there, so you just don't end up meeting and marrying people who are radically racially different from yourself. 
That's really the best thing. I, I remember I was with a friend at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and there was this white woman and her two daughters were walking around the Arms and Armory collection, which is one of my favorite collections there. And they were just so beautiful. And I said to my friend, you know, there really needs to be like a reservation where people like that can exist without being threatened. And I said, you know, it used to be called Europe. <laughs> that was the white people reservation, right? Where we, yeah, we need you know, a reservation. <laughs> and how about Europe? You know, Europe yeah. would be a nice reservation. So that's, that's my attitude. Um, honestly, having a small amount of non-white admixture would not be an issue if we had a growing white population, but we don't. We've got a declining white population, and therefore we can't really be lax about race mixing on into the future. We have to hold the line. Now, what would you, what would my attitude be, say, in an America that is reconstituted on ethnic lines, and there are people who have a marginal, say, African or Amerindian ancestry well i think that basically if they look white think of themselves as white and act white and so forth that they're white people for all intents and purposes for practical purposes however if there are people within that society who want to remain genetically aloof from any admixture that's that's fine i would have no problem with that but the whole purist thing would have to be something that would be not legislated, but simply be a matter of social customs and the preferences that certain communities and families would have. And okay. I think that that would be a reasonable and humane attitude. And I think that that ties in with the Jewish question. What's your perspective on that quickly? Well, the Jewish question is basically this. For, first of all, Jews are a distinct people. Uh, they think of themselves as a distinct people. But there are Jews who, in effect, opt out of being Jewish by intermarrying with uh, non-Jews and dropping their Jewish customs and religion and so forth. And that has happened a lot in the past. And my attitude towards people with marginal Jewish ancestry is this. It's basically a question do you honor your Jewish ancestors decision to opt out of the Jewish community? Or are you going to try and exploit that marginal Jewish ancestry to try and uh, give yourself more credibility and power within the present system, which is largely Jewish dominated? If, if they choose the former, then I don't have any problem with them. If they choose the latter, I start looking dimly upon them, right? Because Jews are basically just Caucasians, right? Mm -hmm. Ashkenaz, I mean, Middle Easterners are all Caucasians. Uh, Ashkenazic Jews are a mixture of people from the Near East and Europe. Uh, they're about 50-50. Honestly, uh, you know, if, if you've got a marginal Ashkenazic ancestry, that that's a very small uh, non-European percentage of DNA. And I just don't think it matters unless you make an issue of it, unless you make it matter, right? You're only as Jewish as you want to be on, on that uh, account. However, on a, uh, as, as for a rule, I would say, let's have no more Jewish Gentile admixture in the future. Let's try and separate ourselves from them. Let's keep our, our peoples distinct uh, and so forth. I think that's a reasonable attitude. Again, amnesty for what happened in the past, as long as people don't make an issue of it, as long as they're not trying to identify with that group based on, on marginal ancestry and a moratorium on, on, going, on it going forward. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the last remaining question is really how on earth do we um, possibly convince <laughs> the majority of the white population to even consider this idea? We convince them by persuading them that it's necessary, first of all, that none of the other political options that are on the table are going to solve the basic problem that white people face, and that is long-term biological and cultural extinction. Conservatives aren't going to conserve us from that. Liberals are pushing it forward. 
we we simply don't have any options. Uh, libertarianism just bear, hides our head in the sand and pretends that it doesn't exist. There are no political options that uh, will save us from long term extinction, both as ethnic groups and as a biological race. And once people get that through their thick heads and realize that it is possible to change this because it's only happened because of bad policies, most of which have been instituted in the last couple of generations, once they get through, get it through their heads that it can be changed and it can be changed in a way that's completely moral. Mm -hmm. What about for people who say, you know, I don't care what the world looks like in 50 years, I'm going to be gone anyway? Well, I think that on one, one level, they're probably lying to you and themselves that they really do care about it. The reason why they say that is because they've given up, because they don't feel that they've got a future, and they're basically afraid of fighting to have a future. And so they're saying, what does it matter anyway? So I think that on, on, a, on a one level, it's just a lie and a cop out. They really do care about that. They just feel helpless. And we have to teach them that no, what it's not hopeless. You're not helpless. People can band together. They can change people's minds and they can change policies. And that's going to happen. It's already happening. The growth in what we're doing has been tremendous recently and will only continue. And we don't need to have an absolute majority on our side. We just need to have a, a highly motivated, influential, and focused minority on our side. And when I see the caliber, the intelligence, the creativity of the people who are coming into this and have come into this in the last couple of years, we are gaining the ears of the best people of, the, uh, of our race, the, the young ones, the, and, and the people who have more future ahead of them and want to fight more for it. So I think things are actually looking up for us. It's going to be a long, hard slog. There's no question about it. But given that nobody else has any solutions or even any inkling of what the problem is, and given that the left is pretty tired and pretty hysterical now that Trump has happened, uh, that Brexit has happened and so forth, they're not attractive they're simply not attractive. And millennials and the next generation after them are noticing that the, the, the multicultural paradise is a lie. Uh, their, mm. their minds are open. So it's not hopeless. In fact, I'm very, very white-pilled about all of this. Uh, it's a great mm. time for us to be alive. And, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a glorious time. I, I have always been skeptical of the greatest generation, you know, propaganda about the World War II generation. I always thought that was rubbish. Now I'm arguing that the millennials will be the greatest generation because <laughs> the millennials are going to be the ones who actually turn this whole thing around. The millennials are going to save our race and save our civilization. And the generation that's coming after them are going to do that as well. So you're the greatest generation. And the best of you are coming over to our side. Uh, and this is a great time to be alive. Yeah, well, it's it's funny you say that because obviously millennials are generally associated with some degeneracy and things like that. But we'll have to see how things turn out, hey. Um, apparently the Generation Z are fairly red-pilled on things. So. Generation Z, yes, that's what... Yeah, uh, the, next, that's what... the next one down. Um, well, I hope... Generation Z is not the last generation. Uh, I know Z is the last letter in the alphabet. Yeah, but, no, but once you get to Z, then it starts over again. This is true. It'll be Generation A after that and a bright new future. So that's, that's my outlook on this. So I think that uh, we, we are changing minds. Uh, we, it's, it's really, again, white nationalism is really the only sober and responsible political position once you understand the situation that our race is in demographically politically and so forth and it's also a completely fair and humane and natural and normal reaction and it doesn't have to be messy and sloppy and immoral and murderous in fact that's the future we're trying to avoid we're trying to avoid a future of mm -hmm. 
constant racial hatred and animosity. And we realize that there, there will never be a world without enemies. But there are ways of reducing conflict. And the best way of reducing conflict is to give distinct peoples with distinct ways of life and a distinct sense of their identity and their destiny separate homelands where they can live without having to constantly fight against people, uh, you know, on the bus, in their job, <laughs> in the supermarket. You know, it, it just gets so tiring to, to constantly to, to leave your home in what used to be your homeland and feel like you're jostling your way through an Arab souk. Which is exactly right. what I have to do every single time I leave the house, basically. It's, it's not very uh, pleasant, I have to say. But I wanted to ask you also, um, what do you think of this kind of whole thing? Like, um, someone asked, someone put this in a more succinct way, but I can't find the question. Why, um, why do you call yourself a white nationalist, even though it's kind of um, associated with the term white supremacist and people use it interchangeably? Do you think they are different? Um, and aren't you worried about the connotations with that term? Because I actually agree with you on 90% of what you've said in this interview. But I wouldn't call myself a white nationalist just because there are connotations, you know, um, that I wouldn't want to be associated with. Right. Well, we are just going to have to change the connotations. That's my attitude. Uh, the, I read an article recently at CounterCurrents, which is my website. It's counter-currents.com on this very issue. Are white nationalists white supremacists? And the answer is no. Actually, we don't want to rule over other races. That's the whole point of being separate from them. Hmm. We don't want to be ruled by them either, but we don't want to rule over them. We hmm. want to be separate. The people who end up being white supremacists are the civic nationalist types, the alt-light types, the Gavin McGinnis types, the people who say, we're just going to surrender to all the demographic changes that have been imposed upon us since 1965. We're not going to change any of that. We're not going to stop it. We're not going to question it. We're just going to surrender to that. But we are going to be Western cultural chauvinists. Well, what does that boil down to? It boils down to enforcing white standards in a multiracial society, enforcing, if you will, white supremacy. Right. We we are we have created a society where 40 percent of the population isn't white, but we're going to demand that they follow all the rules and mores and customs that are most comfortable to white people. Now, of course, the, the hat trick that they use to get out of that implication is to say that our values are universal. We're mm -hmm. avatars of universal humanity. In, you know, as 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 it was put in that um, Apocalypse Now movie by this uh, American, he said, inside every gook is an American trying to get out. And that's why we were there. We're, we're there to, to liberate them from communism and from their own culture and from the past and allow them to be Americans because that's what they really want to be. Well, that's not true. That's not true. Dif different people really are different. And if they're really different, there are ways of life that are going to be more comfortable for them than the European way of life or the American way of life. And that's why they're constantly demanding that we change the way that we live. Mm -hmm. They're trying to become more comfortable. Well, if we say, fine, you're here, we're not going to do anything about it. That would be politically incorrect even to consider it. But we're going to be Western chauvinists and defend the Western way of life, and you damn well better take it, that is de facto white supremacism. We are imposing white standards upon them. And yeah, they might even find a token black who will go along with this, right? The token black in the Trump cabinet or whatever, right? The token black in the Proud Boys, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is that these people are seen by their people as traitors. That's true. Absolutely. And I'm sure we're all familiar with that um, situation of black people being called white just for wanting to go to school. Uh, we've actually come up to an hour. So thank you very much, Greg Johnson, for joining me uh, for this interview. If you guys want to find Greg Johnson's website, it's counter-currents.com. Is there anything else you'd like uh, listeners to go and find from you, maybe books or social media? 
Well, I do have a Twitter account called New Right America. You could look at that and follow that. And I do have a Facebook presence, but my main presence is the CounterCurrents website, counter-currents.com. That lists all of the books that we have published and the books that we sell. There's new content five days a week, sometimes two or three things a day. We have podcasts, we have articles, we have reviews, occasionally a video. It's a very important website. I think it's really the best intellectually mediast anglophone white nationalist website out there. And if you haven't tried it, I w encourage you to come to it. And I want to thank you, Tara, for having me on the show. It's been a really enjoyable experience. Yeah, a great show. And I, I hope all of the listeners enjoyed it. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.